So that voice in your head is part of your emotional brain. And your emotional brain doesn't really have access to language, but your logical brain, which is all language, doesn't really have access to emotion. And so if your emotional brain is going, oh, it's a disaster, it's gonna break, you're gonna be found out to be a fraud, oh my God. Your logical brain just knows, oh my God, I need to freak out. But if I can get your emotional brain to tell me what is going on, what's gonna break? Why are you a fraud? Where are you getting this data? And I can get it to come out of your mouth, your logical brain will go, what? That's what we believe? No, that's not even true. Good morning, HR. I'm Mike Coffey, and this is the podcast where I talk to business leaders about bringing people together to create value for shareholders, customers, and the community. Please follow, rate, and review Good Morning HR wherever you get your podcast. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or at goodmorninghr.com. Every year, companies go through the process of deciding where we want to go. It may be something as visionary as we want to be the preferred place to work for the brightest engineering talent in our market or something as concrete as we want to increase profitability by 5% before the end of the year. That's a smart goal. And if it was as simple as recording our goals in just a one-page business plan, our companies would be full of unicorns and rainbows. But moving our organizations forward requires people. And as you've heard me say before, people are a hot mess. And not just other people, you, as a people leader, are a hot mess too at least some of the time. So as people leaders, how do we get out of our own way and help our organizations move forward through strategy development and tactical, actual execution? Joining me today is Dr. Robin Odegaard. Robin holds a PsyD in Applied Organizational Psychology and serves leaders across the globe as a concierge high-performance psychologist. She's also the author of three books and has an acclaimed TEDx talk entitled Creating Success Out of Chaos. Welcome to Good Morning HR, Robin. Thanks for having me, Mike. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. So let's start with that description of how you help leaders. What is a concierge high-performance psychologist? So that means that I work with everything from life coaching, which I don't love that term, all the way through executive coaching, leadership development, team development, those kind of things. And the concierge part of it is chaos doesn't happen on a schedule. And therefore I think it's unreasonable to tell someone, okay, I will talk to you once a week from two to three on Thursdays. And then that's when you have to tell me everything that's going on. Instead, if someone works with me, if something's going on, call me, text me, email me, and we'll work on it real time. Don't hold your stuff up for the once a week meeting. So you're you're the emergency room. I don't have to <laughs> wait for a doctor's appointment. Okay. Right, exactly. That's, that's perfect. And and we that's what, you know, uh, that's how I, I use my coach and that's also how I use my coffee buddies on, on Tuesday mornings that they get an mm-hmm. earful sometimes because they're the ones who listen. So so with the leaders you work with and and these are all I mean you know, I think you work with, you know, a lot of high level executives and entrepreneurs who, let's face it, um, you know, spend most of the time demonstrating to the world how they know everything and looking completely in control. Um, but what do you find are the biggest challenges that those leaders or most leaders uh, face when they're trying to, you know, really vision, strategize and execute? So these people are the rocks in the world. They are the ones that hold the Venn diagram that is the crazy together. And so they have to look like they know what's going on. If they don't, it's bad for the stock price. It's bad for morale among the company. If they take it home to their spouse, their spouse might be uncertain. Um, If they talk to their board, their board might give them a vote of non-confidence. So these are people who have to have their act together or at least look like they do. The reality is, None of us have our act together that often. That's not a thing. And if you try to do that long enough, it creates burnout and anxiety and stress and anger management issues. And so what I find with these leaders is that they've gone a long time with not really having any kind of 
personal support, inside support, people they can talk to, and people who understand they've got to look at strategy and they've got to look at tactical and they've got psychological barriers within the team and their own. So all these pieces come together and they can create quite the hurricane in their lives. Chaos. And so, and that's not just these high power leaders, right? I mean, uh, HR directors, frontline supervisors, any, you know, we've, you know, as, as a company owner, I, I don't want to instill into my team that, oh, coffee's got no idea what the hell's going on, or, you know, I don't know how to respond to the situation. And, and you know, an HR leader has that, operations leaders have that, that frontline supervisor has that. I mean, people look to whoever their leader is in, at whatever level and need, you know, need some confidence that, they have a clue. Um, but in the reality, sometimes we don't have a clue. And, um, and we don't want to, you know, and we don't want to go put that on those on, on those people who are there, back, you know, we know have our backs and, and they're following us. And, you know, and um, so when we're faced with that, uh, that kind of situation where we don't know what to do, or the we know where we want to go. I mean, you know, the company says we want to be the place where the brightest engineers in our market, uh, you know, want to work, go make that happen. And internally, we're deer in the headlights, even if we're not, you know, if we're not uh, verbalizing it. Um, how do we how do we get ourselves, you know, wrap our heads around it and uh, identify the best way to move forward? So the first thing you have to decide is, am I going to live my default life, which is everything gets thrown at me and I just kind of deal and whatever happens happens, or am I going to create my most achieved life? Do I want it to have that upward tra trajectory? Does things get better as I go forward? And so for most people, they want to say, Oh yeah, I want things to get better. Some people will bump along around the bottom, you know, people like that, and that's fine. That's their default life and that's their choice. But if you're the kind of person who makes the choice, okay, I'm going to live my most created life then you have to start making some decisions. And that's where the five-step paradigm for creating success out of chaos comes from. So those, let's start with those, those folks that are just bumping along. We've all worked with those folks and, and, and mm -hmm. sometimes they're really valuable to the organization, right? They get those work are, done. You know, they, they get work done. And often those are the employees who are here really long-term. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have, you know, especially smaller organizations, you know, we're reliant on those folks because they're the ones who have the company knowledge and they stick around. They don't want to continue to grow. You know, they don't want to be a supervisor, a manager, an executive. They they, they want to put tab A in slot A all day long and, and God bless them because we need them and they get the work done. Absolutely. But we often make those people, hey, they're really good at putting tab A in slot A all day long. So let's make them a supervisor, a manager. And so now, and then maybe they want, you know, they definitely want to succeed in that, but they don't have that skill. So how does, how does, how do we, you know, I've got this problem facing me in my organization that I've, I've got to, you know, report to my upper, uh, upper level bosses and to my team. Uh, and I've got to, I've got to incentivize. I got to, you know, make sure that they're motivated, but I've got this challenge. So you've got this paradigm about, you know, how, how we do that. So what's the, and you know, what's the first question I should be asking myself if I, if I'm that leader, who's trying, you know, who's trying to decide on how to, how to move forward. So the situation you've given us, there's already a goal in place. The organization has given us a goal. You already established that for us. So a lot of times people will say, Oh, you have a goal. You have a vision. You're good. You know, you know what you want to do. Visualize that. But oftentimes that's way too broad. And so the question I like to ask, ask at that point is, what do you want to be different? Because human beings are really good at picking out, oh, this thing here is not working. That thing there isn't working. Now, if you do this in a team, you have to be really careful and not let it turn into a gripe session, obviously. Because the goal here is what do you want to be different? And the caveat being that we can do something about that's going to make a difference. Yeah, saying I, I I want a company where I don't have to have employees or customers and, and I just have money coming in every week is, is would be wonderful, but mm -hmm. it, it's not, it's not realistic. And so, and sometimes just inside of our organizations, we know what the constraints are and there's certain things you're not going to change. 
ourselves. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what do we want to be different? So, so depending on what the goal was, would, you know, it'd be a different answer, but some of, you know, are we asking that ourselves about how we respond? What I want to be different about how I'm internalizing these challenges or are we really talking about the organization or is it both? You can use it either way. That's the thing about this paradigm is you can look at any specific thing and say, I'm going to use it on this and ask the question, what do I want to be different and go in that direction. And as you know, human beings, everything feeds off of everything else. Right. So give us an example of what, how do I, what do I want to be different? Uh, what might that look like? You know, what, you know, so if I say, yeah, I don't want, let's say this, I, I, what I want to be different, I want more direction from my boss. I, I, I want more clarity in where he really wants, you know, uh, us to go. So is that enough or do, or, or do we need to dive deeper into that issue? Well, you can certainly start there. You can certainly start with the idea, okay, what do I want to be different? I want more information from my boss. Now that seems really straightforward. Oh, you just go ask your boss. But that's not usually how things like that work. And so we can use, let's, let's use that idea and take it through the paradigm and kind of see um, kind of what we get. So we've come up with what do we want to be different? That's awesome. So the next thing we got to do is kind of the strategy, which is the problem deconstruction. And in this case, you might need to ask yourself some questions. Maybe if you have the kind of boss that you can engage in the conversation, you can. Like what is keeping your boss from giving you the direction you feel like you need? Do they feel like you you know and they're trying to empower you and be like, hey, you need to take this and run with it? Or are they so focused on something else that they're like, what's happening? Why are you not getting the information you need? And you can strategize about that. And you can do, um, I call it the, the problem deconstruction part of it, which is you do back casting, which is it came to a positive end. What happened? How did we get here? How did it go right? you know, all the good things, but you can also do a pre-mortem, which is start at the negative. Oh, I needed more information from my boss and I didn't get it. And then challenge yourself and or your team to kind of look at what derailed us, what caused failure. And then you can look at how you can avoid that. So those conversations are fun to have if you have a boss that's can engage with you around it. So the back casting, so you're saying six months down the road, whatever the project is or whatever that goes, what we wanted to be different, six months later, it's different. So in order to get there, what did we do to get there? You know, what are those key elements that had to happen for us to get to that point? So, but, but rather than saying, just jumping into a project, which is, I mean, I'm your typical ADHD entrepreneur. I've got this big picture. Okay. The first step is going to be this boom, knock it out, knock it out, knock it out. And, and I'll do whatever I have to do to move, move everything to get there. But often without that detailed plan. So if I would sit down to six months from now and say six months from now, we're going to hit this goal, what will have had to have happened? And fortunately, I've got a team of executors who often make me sit down and do that because they need to know how they contribute, right? Uh, but so that backcasting, that's an interesting term for it. Uh, uh, but yeah, and then the pre-mortem is, okay, if we just blow this, what didn't, if, 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 we, if this thing just goes down in flames, what didn't we do? Uh, this is a should, good question to ask the people who actually do the work. Because the people who actually are, are doing the work are usually pretty good at saying, hey, these kind of things are what can go wrong. Yeah, and I always use uh, with, with my team, you know, what are the failure points? Uh, you know, uh, what's, that's, that's the way we look at it. But it's the same thing, right? Uh, you know, if, uh, if we're going to build this and do this, whatever this is, in six months or whatever the time frame is, what are the failure points? Where, where can we get off track? Where can we go wrong? And often one of those is coffee loses interest and stumbles off on and, and doesn't give leadership or priority or resources to the right things because I'm that entre entrepreneur who loves those shiny objects. Right. But in a, in a, in a larger organization, it could be, you know, it could be similar though. Management changes, you know, management doesn't, doesn't support this. Uh, uh, and if we're in, in the HR world, we're rolling out, you know, we want to roll out this new benefits plan and we want a high level of adoption in it. Uh, but what happens if, you know, if frontline supervisors don't support or, or, or share the information that we need to share, that's, that's going to be one of those failure points. And so, so what, looking back, what could kill this, what's the pre-mortem, uh, just looking for all those places where something might not go as we had, as we want uh, that could be an obstacle to us 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So once you've got those two pieces, now you're ready to actually look at your tactical plan or your structure, which is, okay, we know what we, where we want to get, we have a basic idea. So what resources, what skills, what knowledge, what processes, what do we need to actually make that happen? That's going to be your next question. So if we go back to your thing about, I need more feedback from my boss, maybe you need to have a scheduled meeting okay. that happens. That's where this, the tactical plan would come in. So what are we actually going to actually manifest in the real physical world to make right. something happen? Okay. What do we need? What yeah. needs to actually happen? Yep. And, budget uh, goes yeah, under bu there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Budget, those resources, but, but also those knowledge and skills. I mean, uh, like if, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to lead, let's say the AI initiative into HR in our organization, um, if I'm going to be that leader who's going to do that, then I either need to acquire that knowledge and skills internally or, or resource it from someplace in the organization or outside the organization and say, okay, um, we've got it. You know, this is, this is our shopping list. These are the, the, the competencies that we need in the organization. And maybe we have to go hire outside of those or whatever, but that's going to be part of the, part of the plan. Um, is this also where we, we start design, designing, how we're going to do things, what that roadmap looks like, or is this, or is this just resources? Nope. You can look at roadmap. That's where knowledge and skills come from, tactical plan type stuff. The thing I see leaders make the mistake here is they think they have to know. And what you mentioned that I want to call out, that's really, really good. Sometimes you go get other resources. You, you yourself don't have to know these things, figure it out, have all the answers. I think that's a mistake I see leaders make it here at the tactical space. And I think that's the importance of having peer groups too, right? Uh, whether, you know, I'm in HR peer groups, I'm in entrepreneurial peer groups, but having other people who are competent in whatever domain that you're working in, who you can just bounce ideas off of, uh, you know, I, you know, I am not going to go to my friend with three failed marriages to talk about you know, any struggles I've got in, in my marriage and I'm married to the most wonderful one woman in the world and, and who's very patient. So, I mean, we would never have to do that anyway. She didn't listen to the podcast, but anyway, um, but, uh, you know, so, you know, but those peer groups are real critical. And so for, you know, HR people have, you know, their, their SHRM chapters and, you know, Society for Human Resource Management, they've got their groups of HR professionals there and your network is, is obviously really valuable to, to figure out, you know, where we can get those resources, having somebody outside organization, maybe to, you know, we also get tunnel vision in our organizations. You know, this is the way we've always done it. So I can see, I can see really tapping into that knowledge outside or inside wherever, you know, where bringing we in that go. expert rookie, somebody right. who oh, has yeah. a lot of really good knowledge and is going to ask you those really difficult questions that everybody else is like, well, of course it works like that. And let's take a quick break. Good Morning HR is brought to you by Imperative, premium background checks with fast and friendly service. If you're an HRCI or SHRM certified professional, this episode of Good Morning HR has been pre-approved for one half hour of recertification credit. To obtain the recertification information, visit goodmorninghr.com and click on Research Credits. Then select episode 94 and enter the keyword imposter. That's I am P-O-S-T-E-R. On May 12th, I'll be hosting a webinar entitled Identifying Candidate Behaviors to Help Predict Success. We'll discuss how to glean key candidate behavior styles through assessments, application processes, and interview design. This free webinar is approved for one professional development credit for SHRM certified professionals and one hour of general recertification credit for HRCI certified professionals. You can register for this free webinar at imperativeinfo.com. And if you're listening to this podcast after May 12th, you can still watch the recorded webinar on our website for credit for free. And now back to my conversation with Dr. Robin Odegaard. So what's another challenge that, that, that we've got to you know, overcome or another th thing that we've got to deal with in order to get to the next level? Yeah. So one more thing I want to say about tactical plan, oh, yeah. never hire an expert and then tell them how to do their job. That's a mistake I see leaders oh, make yeah. too. Bring in an expert and then tell them what they're supposed to do. So that's, 
Oh, that's, definitely. That's I, I, yeah, I see job descriptions where we're looking for this really specific experience set, and this person who really knows this, and you know they're really critical to uh, you know us being where we want to be. And then we get in there, and oh well, that's not how we do it here. Right. And uh, you know, or companies. You know, I, I see acquisitions where companies buy their you know other companies because they need this skill set and this. Uh, you know, this knowledge base and all of this that they want to bring into their organization. And, oh, we love the culture here. And then they immediately take it over and screw up all the good stuff, run off the best people and and uh, start, you know, hammering on their culture to make it look like the, mo the mothership's culture. So Because mm -hmm, that's what they're comfortable with. Right. So the next part, once you've got, you know where you're going, you know what you want to have different, you've got your strategy, you've got your tactical plan in place. The next thing where I see uh, a hurdle come, I call it psychological barriers, but this is basically the place where I know what I should be doing, but we're not doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think that's really bad. I think entrepreneurs are really bad about that uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, so you know, it's the pain of right now uh for whatever change we want to do uh outweighs that future goal you know mm -hmm. and uh i think that's so how do you how do we deal with those kind of things uh you know because just getting past not you know, you know for i guess there's a lot of reason what let's start there what are the reasons that we we won't do what we know we need to do so there's a couple of different reasons. And the thing I like to remind people is it's usually not your fault, but it is your problem. Mm, okay. So there's probably something there could be cultural issues within the organization. Uh, there could be, there's some, could be some self-sabotage among the team members. We could have imposter syndrome. We may have upper limiting problems. There could be people who are feeling overworked, but underutilized, which makes them feel overwhelmed and just burnt out. So there's a lot of different things that can cause this, but the part that I feel like is really important is to take advantage of is this, the cause is in the past. Whatever's causing you to not take action is in the past. The solution is in the present. What you do today determines whether tomorrow is gonna to be a continuation of yesterday or something different. The challenge is the motivation is in the future. Hmm. So what I do today will make this project better six months from now or six years from now. So I have to figure out how do I take that motivation from the future and bring it into today? Because otherwise I'm just going to have a continuation of yesterday. And that means there's no hope for a difference tomorrow. And in your TEDx talk, you really kind of dealt with that idea of imposter syndrome, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's not always something that that's probably rarely something that we're really generating initially on ourselves. It's, it's something that we're being having put on us. We're given. But, yes. Yeah. So talk about imposter syndrome, because I, I see that a lot in extremely competent professionals who, mm -hmm. who, who are so filled with self doubt or, you know, insecurity about their ability, you know, should I be the person here? Mm -hmm. in this role leading this project to move us forward and it's so important and and I'm really the right person how do we deal with 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 that the, those those kind of thoughts so there's a couple of different things the first one is pay attention to the people around you so do you have people from your past who are telling you you're a fraud you can't do this what's going on you know the what I say in my TEDx talk is if if you learn there's no water in a well stop going there looking for a drink and so, so many of us do still have often family members in our lives who are those, oh, I don't know, can you do that? Do you know what you're doing? Are you sure? And those voices build on our imposter syndrome. The other thing to listen to is the people around you who do know you and who say things like, you're really good at this. And then the question becomes, do I know myself well enough to know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at? And oftentimes we know we're good at something, even though that saboteur voice in our head is saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Are you sure you can do that? Yeah. And so people bring, you know, other, if we let other people put a lot of trash uh, in our backpacks, you know, and, and, you know, the, and we'll just carry it around that that's where that stuff comes from. So now I see it. And so I'm hearing it. I've got this colleague who, you know, 
maybe they think they're doing the right thing. Maybe they're, they're, they think they're saving me from, you know, embarrassment or failure by, uh, you know, playing devil's advocate. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and really it's, it's not, you know, constructive, but, um, what are the things we can do as we're, as we're to recognize those things and to, to alter how we, we process or hold on to them? Some of it is if you have a good relationship with that person, you can actually ask, what is your goal with this? How are you trying to help me Mm. and see if they have an answer? Sometimes they don't. They might actually be trying to sabotage you. But if you have a good relationship where you can say, I'm not understanding how this helps me. Can you explain it to me? That can be one thing. The other thing is listen to what the voice in your head says. I sometimes ask my clients, do you believe what the voice is telling you? I named my voice so I can recognize her really easily. Her name is Harriet. And I tell her all the time that she's a lot, she's part of my life. She's allowed to come along. She cannot drive and she cannot navigate. But every once in a while, she does say, Hey, watch out for that pothole. And I'm like, okay, I got it. Thank you very much. So she's not all bad news, but recognize what the voice in your heads are saying. And I actually ask my clients, tell me what you believe right now. Because what I find is if you can get it out of your mouth, so that voice in your head is part of your emotional brain and your emotional brain doesn't really have access to language, but your logical brain, which is all language, doesn't really have access to emotion. And so if your emotional brain is going, oh, it's a disaster, it's gonna break, you're gonna be found out to be a fraud, oh my God. Your logical brain just knows, oh my God, I need to freak out. But if I can get your emotional brain to tell me, what is going on? What's going to break? Why are you a fraud? Where are you getting this data? And I can get it to come out of your mouth. Your logical brain will go, what? That's what we believe? No, that's not even true. And so it's just the stories that we're telling ourselves in, yep. in our head. And I think you see that in, in organizations too. I mean, really innovative organizations 15, 20 years ago, um, you know, and examples that people have thrown out there are Google and companies like that who were really innovative at one point are telling themselves that story on a really broad company wide basis. And so, you know, leadership and how they make decisions and who they hire, who they incentivize, who they promote and allowing for failure. Yeah. What do they allow for failure? Uh, um, those kind of things. And they become, if they're not, they become less innovative. And we see those, the, the, bigger the company, the more their innovation comes through acquisition, right? They're hiring, Mm -hmm. they're looking outside there and they're hiring these young upstart organizations to, to do the innovation. You know, they're buying these other, you know, the, the preexisting innovations of other folks. Uh, and that's a leadership issue, right? That's uh that's how leadership's thinking, you know, and when you're, especially when you're playing with other people's money, I can see where that gets, you know, you know, how much risk can we take? Uh, and, so if we, but it, whether it's at the organizational leadership level or at the, you know, just our, our front line doing our jobs every day, supervisors and managers, uh, what are those, t- let's go through those questions again that we, they should be asking themselves. Cause I, I want to make sure we get those really clear from, from this, for this particular yeah, uh, piece. Yeah. The, yeah. For, for this imposter syndrome or that's the, you know, the stories that we're carrying, how do we, how do we right. unravel those? So the first thing, remember, it's probably not your fault, but it is your problem, which means if you want to pass blame and go sit on a therapist's couch and do that, you can, but if that's not going to fix it, you got to figure out how to fix it. You have to remember that cause is in the past, the solution is in the present, and the motivation is in the future. So the easiest thing to do is to let the present be a continuation of the past, and that'll leave you no hope for a different future. Uh, Okay. So just keep doing what we've always already always done. Keep thinking the way we've always thought. And you're going to get what you always have. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And so the last piece to the paradigm is people, places, things, and habits that are either helping or hurting. And this, I see a lot in organizations. This is where your culture is really going to burn you because you have habits that are just not healthy. Right. Yeah, and that's uh, I'm a giant fan of of James Clear's Atomic Habits, and mm-hmm. and he says that we've got, and I can't remember all the. I think there's uh, the outside, the outcomes that we want to get, 
And then inside there's the tactics and the processes we use. And I'm a real systems guy, so I really get that. But then inside the internal one is the story we tell ourselves on a mm -hmm. daily basis about who we are or who the organization is. And so if we want to, you know, let's say we, in the organization, we want to change our, uh, uh, we want to be more successful in our diversity efforts. And so, you know, we can start measuring outcomes and that's great, but unless we change our systems, we're not going to get those outcomes, but unless we change the story about we're the kind of organization that hires based on competencies, regardless of other factors, we're the kind of organization where people are going to thrive regardless of their background. Those are the stories that we have to continually tell uh, mm -hmm. to change the culture, I think. And a question I like to ask is, are you the kind of organization who keeps that lone wolf, really good performer does, but is wreaking havoc in right. your organization. If you're the kind of organization that keeps that kind of person, you're never gonna have really successful teams. You're gonna have one-off individuals. Yeah, John Amici, the British psychologist says, uh, your culture is defined by the worst behavior tolerated. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that on a podcast and uh, I heard it and I pulled over and and wrote it down because it was like the aha moment on how to how to look at that. And I think that's really true if if we've got somebody something really negative, uh, you know, and everybody sees, right? Everybody sees who we're incentivizing, who we're rewarding for their behavior. And um uh, and it's a cancer. So, you know, and we think we can't get rid of this person because they've got these key client relationships. Or, you know, they've got this unique uh in you know, institutional knowledge that we, we can do without, or the worst one, we, we've, we've got so much invested in them. How do right. we, you know, how we can't Chase walk away from that sunk cost. Right. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so the question we, I ask my, my clients, cause again, they're high level leaders. How would you know? How do you mean? So what does that mean? Yeah. Follow up. It Tell means me from the bottom, if you work at the bottom, you can see the really bad leaders, the guy who never shows up for meetings, the guy who disappears, who doesn't answer your emails when you need him. You see that because it directly impacts your ability to do your job. But if you're a high level leader and this person that's not doing their job is two or three layers below you, how would you know? And that would have to be what's your feedback loop? Where are, you, where are you getting information in the organization? Who are you what, believing? Who are you believing? What are you measuring? And are those measures the things that are, you know measure your progress towards the outcomes? Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yeah. Because I see a lot of situations where leaders think they know and they have no idea what's going on. You see it like in Undercover Boss and shows like that in a big way. That's not that uncommon, sadly. Well, I think we see it in our political life too, right? We see people who are well-meaning mm -hmm. and uh but they're so detached from the you know the dinner table economics and politics of what what families actually deal with that they you know th their prescriptions are often you know very academic sometimes or gut feelings you know we've mm -hmm. got to do something but they're not they're not the things that are really going to make meaningful change so and you may have a leader that's really good at looking good to you and treating their employees awful. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think that happens a lot. The senior level executives really think, hey, this, this mid-level executive is a rising star. You know, you know she's a, a hot shot. She's, you know, just, you know, uh, rocking every, you know, she's brilliant. But everybody under her is getting stepped on. They're afraid to, to give their, their feedback and, and certainly have had more than my share of employee relations conversations, uh, you know, with, in organizations where, you know, if they would pay attention, this, this complaint and this complaint aren't one offs about that leader, right? It's, we're getting it, uh, on the way. And that's not going to be the leader who's going to especially help you move change through the organization. Cause it's going to hit her and that's a ro that's a roadblock. So, what do you tell organizations when we, you know, as an organizational leader, when I see that thing, I know where we want to go. I know the change we need to make. And maybe I'm beginning to realize that maybe the person in this seat isn't the right person. So how do we, how do we address that? That depends a lot about how your culture is set up and whether that person is willing to grow. Is that someone that you can grow into what they need? Are they a, a lifetime learner? Are they someone that can pivot? 
then maybe they can be the right person. But if you've got someone who's stagnant and doesn't want to grow and doesn't want to change, that's a, that's a hard sell. What about that? Okay, let's go back to our original. I, I need more feedback from my boss in order to be really successful in a row. But I've got a boss who doesn't have those skills, that feedback skill that uh, they're, um, they get – yeah, you know, maybe they've got they've got their own mental trash that's keeping them from from being a supportive, engaging boss. How do I approach that? What are what are some what are some things that you know this is not this is a boss who's not helping me uh, do what I need to do for the organization or be successful personally. But it's unless I leave the organization, changing my boss, changing bosses is probably not just an an option. So how mm -hmm. would you, how do we address those kind of issues? Well, let me learn a little bit more about this boss. Is this a boss who wants to help you or is, and just doesn't have the skills or is this a boss who actively wants to hold you down? Let's say it's a boss who, who we feel like act, you know, maybe that's a story we're telling ourselves too, but you know, who actively wants to keep us in our place, uh, ensure that there's no question of dominance, uh, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in that situation, where else can you get this information is one question. The other, the challenge that I see in these situations where you have a boss who is actively trying to keep you in your spot is that they won't give you information. And then when you make a decision, because a decision doesn't had to be made, like something had to be done, they're going to second guess you in Monday morning quarterback mm -hmm. you. And so what I would say is make sure you keep your documentation. HR says it all the time, right? Keep your documentation ask in writing, send emails, or, you know, if you have, if you have a channel that you use, you do it in writing, ask for, I need this, this, put deadlines on it. I need this information by end of day, Tuesday, put the date, not just Tuesday, put Tuesday, whatever the date, because otherwise they're gonna be, oh, I thought you meant like Tuesday, three weeks from now, whatever. So keep your documentation, but ask yourself other questions like, where can I get this information otherwise? And what might that look like? And really start making it obvious that you're making these good decisions to the broader organization. So if your boss does start to badmouth you, there are other people who are like, wait a minute, but I saw this and that went really well. So you have maybe can get some other people to help you out. So we're up against the, the clock and I, this has flown by, but let me ask, what would your, for an organization leader who has a big picture of change that they want to make in an organization, what would be your, your big takeaway for when they want to start moving towards implementing that? What would, what would be the, 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 your overarching message for them? And, and this is going to sound cliche, but the bottom line is have better conversations. Be better at explaining this is where I want to go. This is what I need. What are you seeing about this? Ask really good questions. And there's, there's a, a, a thing out there called clean language, which is the ability to ask a question that allows the other person to share their side without you putting your layer of, this is what I want you to say to me over the top of it. So ask questions that are very much, this is where I want to go. How can you help me get there? Because if you just come in and go, this is where we're going and this is how it's going to be, you know as well as I do, you can't drag people that way. It doesn't work. So if I if I, I see the change, rather than saying, "Hey, here's what we need to do. Can you do this particular thing for me?" Come back mm -hmm. and say, "Okay, this is where we want to go. How can you help us get there?" Mm -hmm. what, and, and, and so don't leaders, be so prescriptive, right? Okay. If we're very prescriptive, people are just going to be like, "All right, fine, I'll do that. It's going to be a house fire, but I'll do that." Because mm -hmm. they won't give you feedback because they've determined you're the kind of leader who knows it all already. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Robin. I had fun talking to you, Mike. I knew I would. Enjoyed. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. You can comment on this episode or search our previous episodes at goodmorninghr.com or on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And don't forget to follow us wherever you get your podcast. Rob Upchurch is our technical producer, and you can reach him at robmakespods.com. And thank you to Imperatives Marketing Coordinator, Marianne Hernandez, who keeps the trains running on time. And I'm Mike Coffey, as always. Don't hesitate to reach out if I can be of service to you personally or professionally. I'll see you next week, and until then, be well, do good, and keep your chin up.